Welcome everyone to the Carbon Accounting webinar, one of the learning modules in the fabric and structure of a net zero build project, which is part of the wider low carbon learning programme. This programme aims to support industry working towards achieving net zero in the built environment. Today, we will discuss carbon accounting and look at how it provides us with tools, not only to quantify and me measure carbon emissions, but also to help us make informed decisions in regards to mitigation strategies. This upskilling project is funded by Skills Development Scotland as part of the National Transition Training Fund with an aim to support those working in industry to, be, to develop more green skills. The desire to upskill in low carbon construction has never been more relevant. Over the next few weeks, we will be offering fully funded training with online modules and practical training at a renovation factory. Our focus is on four key areas, taking a fabric first approach in the drive towards greater energy efficiency carbon accounting and why this is helping industry work towards achieving net zero, mass timber solutions and developing an understanding of the processes and practices of sustainable materials. The training will consist of online immersive training which will be available at the end of June and practical training courses which will take place in the innovation factory throughout the month of May and also in summer of June. Spaces in the practical training course are limited, so make sure you book your space after the webinar today. Just to say as well, all the training sessions, including the practical sessions at the factory, are free. My name is Kay Keenan, and I'm an Impact Manager in Modern Methods of Construction at BEST, formerly known as Construction Scotland Innovation Centre. If you have any questions regarding this project, please get in touch. Today, we're going to hear from some experts who are leading the way around applying carbon accounting techniques in the built environment. We'll hear from Dr. Sarah Graham, who's a Chartered Building Service Engineer, who supports industry around carbon accounting solutions and will be developing the carbon accounting module. Leah Alvarez, a Climate Impact Manager of EIT Climate, overviewing the impact of more than 400 companies per year. And finally, we'll hear from Anne-Marie Gillespie, an Impact Manager from BEST, who works within our sustainability team and has done and has developed a model for carbon accounting. Before I hand over to our first speaker, I just want to cover some housekeeping with you. If you want to ask a question, please click on the question icon and post it there and we'll try to answer it in our Q&A slots. The webinar will be recorded and the link will be posted in social network channels. Finally, there will also be some polls throughout the webinar, which we are keen for you to participate in. And after the webinar, there will be an evaluation form for you to complete as it helps us provide the best service we possibly can. First of all, here's a short video capturing our project. Now let me hand, hand over to Leah Alvarez. Leah Alvarez has a Bachelor's in Architecture, an MSc in Industrial Ecology from TU Delft and Leiden University, and is a Climate KIC Master Label and Accredited Professional in Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design, specialising in Operation and Maintenance. She is the CEO and Founder of Fair by Nature and currently works as the Climate Impact Manager of EIT Climate KIC, overviewing the impact of more than 400 companies a year. Welcome, Leah. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining today. And uh, for starting my presentation, I want to start with a quick question. I want to ask you if um, if you want to build yourself a new home, 
If you want to build yourself a new home, which one of these materials do you think it has the lowest CO2 emission? Please choose, uh, choose between the different options. One is grid, concrete, or wood. I will give you a minute to choose. I yeah, don't know if you can see the answers, but it's 92% wood and 8% brick. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, it's good to know uh, that. Now I'm going to share my screen. And I want to tell you that the actual answer is brick. As you can see, sometimes the impact is a little bit uh, different as well what you think. The reason for this is because it depends a lot if the material is newly stacked or is recycled, if where the energy to, uh, to harvest the material or process the material came from, and how far the materials needed to travel to be able to produce the material. Now I'm going to go a little bit deep into this so you have an idea of how how uh, measuring impact of different construction materials looks like. So the first thing is that we need to see what is the lifespan of the material that we are going to choose for a construction. You can see that brick is more than 100 years, concrete as well, but wood, wood in average is between 30 to 50 years. So you can see that wood has a little less lifespan in comparison to brick and concrete. Then we have uh, what is the amount of emissions per each one of the materials when you're thinking of building, a, let's say, a house of 137 square meters. Uh, when you have brick, you have 0.15 tons of CO2 per ton of material. Meanwhile, in concrete is 0.85 and in wood is 0.5. You will say, how is possible that brick has lower emissions than concrete and wood? Well, concrete is quite... Uh, is quite straightforward. The reason why it's, it has so much impact is because you have a process called clinker, that is when you take out the, the cement from the, from the mountain and then you start to process all of this material to be able to get to the, okay, to the, to the cement that you later on you're going to use to create concrete. Then wood, uh, to be able to harvest wood, you need to have uh, trees plants, and then you need to take care of the, the trees, and then you need to harvest all these trees, process the, the wood, and transport, transport it to the place where it's going to be used. So in this case, wood is only sustainable if you live close by to a place where you have the wood that is being uh, grown, then you can harvest it and use it locally. In the case that you don't live close by to a forest, then brick is actually the most sustainable one. The reason for this is because the only energy that it, use, it is used to create it is the, for the process of the cooking. But what happens if you reuse the material? Well, you can see that the emissions go, uh, go down drastically when you reuse the material. In this case, the steel brick is the winner. Uh, however, if you reuse the wood from another construction, you lower it uh, 0.3%, 0.3 tons per ton of material. So it's quite a lot. So when you add all of this, you can see that brick is the winner. But as I said uh, at the beginning, it depends a lot on the location of the construction. It depends a lot if you're reusing the material and also uh, how far the material needs to travel. If you use the materials locally, it will always have a more positive emissions in comparison to the other ones. So the construction sector, this is how it looks today. First, you have an idea, you want to build it, then you get the materials and you start building that, uh, uh, that house, or let's say that house instead of a building, and then you build this house. Then maybe, let's say, uh, in 50 years or something like that, you are going to demolish this house because maybe it doesn't uh, follow the, require, the current requirements of the new family that is going to live there or you, need, or you want to build another thing there or something like that. 
So then you take apart all of the material that is from that house and you take it to the landfill or you incinerate it. And most of the time, if you're lucky enough, that material is going to go to make roads. But if we want to achieve to actually be net zero and to become circular, we need to think, think that when we are designing a building or we are thinking of a new construction, what will happen if we use the material of the construction that was previously there of, or a construction that it was demolished maybe 100 kilometers away of where this new construction is? Because there is new methods that you can use to just extract the material from the previous construction and then reuse it on the new one. My question to you is, uh, when we talk about a circular economy model for the construction sector, do you think that we are talking about net zero? The actual answer is no. Net zero is always about time. It doesn't, it, it, ma it matters how do you, you design a building and how you choose the materials, but the most important thing is how much how much time that building is going to last. If that building is going to be there for 100 years, 200 years, 500 years, that building is going to become net zero because that means that all of the resources needed to extract the materials, process the materials and put it inside of the building uh, slowly are going to become positive because they are not uh, consuming resources anymore. So to be able to design a building that is net zero, you need to take in consideration flexible designs. Um, flexible designs, so in this way, uh, different users can use that building or that space, and they're going to they're going to have the the best outcome of that space, and they're not going to want to refurbish it, demolish it, or or move to another place. Also, you need to take in consideration long-lasting materials that have the minimum maintenance because there is materials that are long lasting, but they require constant maintenance or like, uh, or a specific, yeah, constant maintenance to maintain them on the optimum, uh, yeah. The other thing is that you need to always think about local materials. In this way, if, if a little piece of, uh, a little piece of the material that you're using for that construction, is uh, damaged, you can just use another one. It's also easier to maintain, it's also easier to extract, it's also easier to transport. Everything becomes way easier and more positive because the longer distances that you, you need to, uh, to travel to get for one material is the most difficult is to maintain that material and also the more emissions that you're creating. As I said before, sometimes it's needed. Uh, maybe you are not going to find uh, uh, steel or aluminium nearby, so then you need to uh, to, uh, to export it from China or another place. That is fine. Meanwhile, you design everything to make it last. And uh, if you want to achieve a building to become net zero quicker, you need to design it in a world in a way that is self-sufficient. What I mean by this is that have solar panels so it creates their own energy. Um, okay, so and have solar panels so you create your own energy. Collect the rain so you have water maybe in the toilets and in different areas that you don't need to have like uh, that someone is not washing their hands or something like that. So there is different ways of using the resources nature is already giving you in that place. So in this way you use less resources and so you have you become positive quicker so what is really important and is uh, something that i want to give just a take-home message is to always think about the five r's so first when you're thinking of a new construction a new design or, or something similar first is to refuse all of the materials that you don't think that actually are needed just tr try to keep the essentials then try to reduce those materials to what is actually needed again for the construction and is not something just to uh, maybe prettify it unless you think that is completely necessary. Then reuse material, try to look for material that is going to become waste from another construction or, uh, or nearby. So in this way you reduce your impacts. 
then repurpose. An example of this is I have seen a few times that they take doors of an old building and they uh, transform, transform it into tables. So in this way, you're reusing, the, repurposing the material, changing their use, but it's still making it functional and even interesting for uh, your construction. And lastly, recycle. Recycle is the last one. The reason for this is because you need a lot of energy and a lot of resources to process a material. So it's always best to keep it as the last option and try to uh, to refuse, reduce, reuse or repurpose before recycling. Every time that you think about recycling, you are going to add more resources and more emissions to, to your building. However, it's always better than, you, than just buying new. Okay, so this is uh, my presentation and I hope it has been useful for you. And I look forward to your questions later on. Thank you, Leah. Uh, and everyone will have an opportunity to ask Leah some questions um, at the end of the presentations. So now we've got time to hand over to a poll, our, first, our second poll of today. So on a scale of one to five, what is your level of knowledge of carbon accounting in the built environment? Okay, and that's came in three. So most people have some knowledge, 18% uh, with no knowledge. No one has seen they're an expert, which is which is actually what we would expect because I don't think any of us are an expert in this field at the moment. Um, but um, with that, what I will do is hand, let, hand you over now to Sarah. Um, Sarah uh, is, will be developing the module content and also be delivering the practical training. So Sarah has over 25 years experience in sustainable building design and operation and has a passion for building performance. A chartered building services engineer and a doctor of engineering, she currently has her own consultancy supporting industry towards transition towards greener solutions within the built environment. Welcome Sarah. Hi. Okay, so I need to share <clears throat> the presentation. Can you see the presentation yet? No. Yes, we can. It just needs to be in presenter mode, thanks. Oh, good. Okay, I'll just put the webcam off now. And... Okay, how's that? Oops. Still in. Yep, oh, there we are. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Right. That started going there, though. So I don't want to do the. I just want the slideshow. Sorry. I don't want. Okay. So, hi. I'm Dr. Sarah Graham, founder of Creative Building Performance. Um, I'm delighted to be involved in the Best Low Carbon Learning series. And as part of that, I want to run through this carbon accounting introduction to the, the module, as Kay mentioned. So <clears throat> I'll give an outline of the processes associated with carbon accounting. We'll look at some of the risks and opportunities around it, and also consider carbon accounting within the wider context of sustainable construction. Oh, jeez. Stop. Oh, dear. We don't want the recorded version, but do we? Okay, <clears throat> sorry. Okay, so looking at carbon accounting in the wider contents, context of sustainable construction. The learning outcomes of the module included helping the learner to develop a general overview of the key processes and practices behind carbon accounting, to develop an improved understanding of the barriers, challenges, risks, benefits, uh, drivers and opportunities, and also to look at the link between sustainability, net zero construction and carbon accounting. And lastly, just to sort of look at why, why do we need, why does the construction industry need to transition to carbon accounting approach as standard on projects? So there are a number of national occupational standards that relate to carbon accounting. I've listed those. Again, those will be included in a bit more detail within the module itself. 
You can find them by going to the UK Standards homepage, the link for which is shown. And there are also a number of industry bodies and organisations that provide advice, support, training, etc., in relation to carbon accounting, net zero, and sustainability in general. And those are again listed here, some of them anyway. So let's just delve in to look at carbon accounting process in a little more detail. <clears throat> the term carbon accounting means calculating the carbon footprint of a building, a structure or indeed a business. Sometimes referred to as greenhouse gas accounting, the two terms are interchangeable because carbon dioxide accounts for 76% of greenhouse gas emissions. So greenhouse gases contribute to global warming by trapping long-wave radiation within the Earth's atmosphere, which results in the greenhouse effect, which I'm sure people are, have, are aware of. And climate change is, direct, is linked to the greenhouse, sorry, climate change linked to the greenhouse effect is directly related to human activities. So we require rapid and deep reductions in greenhouse gas emissions to reduce the impact of climate change, including extreme weather, flooding and food shortages, amongst others. Buildings have a, a huge impact on carbon emissions. So in 2020, CO2 emissions from the operation of buildings increased to their highest level at around 10 gigatons, or 28% of total global energy-related CO2 emissions. If you add emissions from construction into that, the share increases to 38%. The current business model of construction, maintenance, modification and replacement of buildings and infrastructure is a major contributor and a significant producer of waste and is here indicated as direct emissions. Emissions from power generation for electricity and commercial heat are represented as indirect emissions. Within the module, we'll examine how fabric first approach to construction and refurbishment projects can contribute to reducing emissions and carbon accounting enables us to take stock of emissions and look to effectively reduce them. A term that you'll hear often in relation to carbon accounting or greenhouse gas accounting is scope one, two and three emissions. And we'll just look at this briefly today. Many companies start with scope one and two emissions, which are typically within their control. Scope one covers companies' facilities, so offices, factories, depots and any vehicles owned as well as processes like manufacturing. Scope two covers indirect emissions that the company uses, but is not responsible for the production of, for example, purchased electricity. And scope three, which is the most challenging area, is everything else. And this will vary depending on the type of business. So scope three for manufacturers could cover uh, the use of products sold, so downstream use. Scope three for a property management company might include landlords, goods and services and occupants purchased energy. And scope three for construction firms will be things like transportation and distribution of materials to and from site. So some of the legislation, regulation standards and publications, let's look at those. Um, I've just summarised some of the legislation and regulation. So the Climate Change Act, um, environmental report and guidelines produced by the UK government, the IPCC report, which details the physical science basis behind climate change. Um, Energy Performance Buildings Directive we have here in the UK, and obviously Part L Belgian Regulations, which is conservation of fuel and power. So, science-based targets accompany carbon accounting as a way for companies to define emission redu reduction targets. So these are top down as opposed to sort of potential based effectively setting a budget um, within different sectors of, of UK um, business industry um, to limit the amount of carbon emissions in line with the Paris Climate Agreement, so limiting global warming to, to 1.5 degrees. The Net Zero Standard, which was published in October 2021, gives companies a science-based framework for defining ambitious and effective climate targets with the long-term goal of achieving net zero. So the driving force behind this is 
a, a sort of collaboration between um, Carbon Disclosure Project, uh, WRI and World Wildlife Fet Fund, developing methods and criteria for effective corporate climate action and validating corporate targets. The key requirements set out in the standard include aiming for rapid and significant reduction, so around 90% across scope 1, 2 and 3 for businesses, short and long-term climate targets, so achieving something like 50% by 2030 in order to achieve net zero by 2050, for example, no net zero aspiration until the goals are achieved, so no claims can be made until progress has actually been made, which is one way to combat greenwashing, so companies claiming they've, they've done A, B and C without effectively backing it up, and then to act beyond the value chain, so that's investment and encouraging the participants to invest in nature-based solutions like carbon capture, for example. There are a number of standards, many and varied standards. Um, GRI is one example, the Greenhouse Gas Protocol, ISO 14064, all of which give guidance and training and support um, and essentially a framework for organisations to work to, to to measure and effectively communicate their environmental performance. The Streamlined Energy and Carbon Reporting, SECR, which is mandated in the UK for companies over 250 employees or £50 million pounds turnover. Um, ESOS, the Energy Savings Opportunity Scheme, also mandatory for companies over a certain level, again, 250 um, people, sorry, that's 50 million streamlined energy and carbon reporting is, is a lower turnover. But these are very similar, although with different reporting time frames. So SECR is annual, ESOS is every four years, um, and there's slightly different boundaries and things like that as well that companies have to look at and different things, metrics to be reported. The Carbon Disclosure Project is voluntary, but a number of UK, uh, larger UK firms have already signed up to that as well as a means of demonstrating their environmental performance in terms of carbon emissions, um, deforestation and water security. So those are some of the standards. Okay. Sorry. But if you boil the various standards down, there is a process that, that is typically followed and it's it's broken down as follows. So step one is to determine the boundary and that will be set out within the chosen framework depending on which one you choose. So it's important that the firm chooses one that they are comfortable fits with their business processes. Decide what is in scope and out of scope for the organisation and then communicate that to stakeholders. Step two is to set up data collection and management processes. If the organisation doesn't currently collect any information on greenhouse gas emissions, there will need to be new processes put in place. And then establish responsibilities, roles, duties within that um, in terms of who's going to collect the information and, and how it's to be processed. The third step is to, to produce and submit the report. And step four, which is third party verification, this is essential really to again try and combat greenwashing. It's much greater transparency around environmental performance as well as things like social value is required going forward so that investors can make informed decisions and it's something again that's being sort of ratified across the different frameworks. There's a lot of effort going into aligning the different frameworks at the moment to make it easier for organisations to, to choose how they want to move forward with it. Okay, so I want to minimise that. Um, okay, so some of the challenges then associated with carbon accounting from a, a construction industry perspective include lack of mandatory emission reductions targets. So for that, for the construction process itself, materials extraction and operational carbon as well. Lack of certification of materials, enabling construction firms to make positive choices. Lack of transparency and accessible data related to operational energy and embodied carbon. Lack of mandatory operational energy targets. 
and a slow response of the construction industry to digitisation. BEST um, carried out a, a review recently, and this is one of the, the sort of challenges that was flagged up by that piece of work. Some of the risks are particularly the fact that the regulation and legislation um, is sort of tightening up. So in April 2019, SECR was expanded to include more medium sized companies as opposed to just large corporations. Um, so there is a risk for even for companies which fall out with the SECR catchment of sort of being left behind because the larger companies, larger contractors, for example, requiring smaller suppliers to demonstrate their environmental performance within the supply chain as the tier one contractor has responsibility for the, the sort of performance um, across the value chain. The risk is of not taking on some carbon accounting as of sort of being left out of that and being left behind, I guess. Some of the benefits then include reduced energy and resource cost, avoidance of penalties associated with inaccurate reporting, improved understanding of exposure to the risk of climate change, demonstration of leadership, attracting socially responsible investment, increased shared shareholder confidence and tracking progress against goals. And finally, strengthening all of that to strengthen market position for businesses. Some of the drivers include shareholder and stakeholder requests for better disclosures in companies' annual reports and accounts, and organisations seeking information from suppliers on environmental performance. Investment due diligence, uh, staff engagement, green messaging, so the marketing potential of companies that are actually robustly measuring and able to confidently express, communicate their environmental performance. And then more and more in tender requirements for, for government contracts particularly. And again, differentiation in competitive markets for large and small companies. Some of the opportunities we see arising are particularly again for construction firms, circular economy. So because of the involvement in demolition, demolition and refurbishment, the opportunity to reuse and recycle, as Leah was describing, it arises there. So, so there's a big opportunity for construction firms to sort of embed themselves within the circular economy principle. So innovative product development as well. We start to see things like cement be concrete, recycled steel obviously has been used for quite some time. Locally sourced materials, again, going back to what Leah was saying about the use of timber, we see you know, an upturn in, in timber frame construction and the demand for environmentally friendly buildings that aligns with occupiers sustainability and net zero goals. So we have seen in recent times large firms actually changing um, the premises that they're, they're using to premises that are maybe more aligned with their own net zero um, goals. And Obviously, re refurbishment. I mean, there's a massive upswing again in refurbishment of existing buildings to bring them up to speed with some emerging trends, like, for example, you know, using low carbon ga glass or retrofit and smart metering throughout the building so that we can effectively capture the data that we need for carbon accounting. Um, there is evidence as well to suggest that environmental reporting generally delivers new business opportunities and that's again for small and large firms. So relative to net zero, carbon accounting is absolutely fundamental. Again, just reiterating the point that if we don't measure um, performance, we can actually demonstrate improvement over time. So I would say what get, gets measured, gets managed um, is the, the sort of quote to use in, in consideration of these. We can, you know, capture what we already know and what we don't know about moving to net zero as an organisation without actually starting to measure the baseline where we start today and then look at what's possible over time by testing different scenarios. UKGBC um, and their whole life carbon roadmap have actually set out, uh, obviously, a roadmap a trajectory for the built environment. So it's it's well worth checking out the work that UKGBC have been doing. 
um, looking at by the sort of science-based targets that we talked about, so setting sectoral budgets and subsectoral budgets as well to enable the net zero 2050 target to be achieved. Um, they've been involved in producing some really useful and easy to understand guidance um, to help construction firms particularly get started on their net zero journey. So the, the sort of need to transition is becoming more and more apparent. Obviously, we have the sort of high level uh, goals, the, the UK government setting net zero by 2050, Scotland 2045, Wales 95% by 2050. But more recently as well, in September last year, um, the government as a procurement body has set out the fact that any, in any project over a value of £5 million will require the bidder to have produced um, carbon plan so in order to bid there has to be some commitment to net zero and some carbon plan that demonstrates how that organization will achieve net zero so the pressure is is on i would say it's definitely increasing and um, there are lots of resources out there again these are covered in a bit more detail within the the actual module itself within the curriculum the online learning and the practical workshops so another good reason to to sort of sign up to those, I would say, is to find out more about what resources are out there. And finally, just to sort of say, you know, it's great that the best are actually producing um, these sort of learning opportunities and definitely worth uptaking. Carbon accounting is daunting for many firms where and how to start. Do, do you really need to get involved with it? Um, I would highly recommend the course and I think it will be extremely valuable in helping if you haven't already started. That's me. Thank you, Sarah. It really helps us to understand carbon accounting and how it can play a key role in building a more sustainable built environment. There will be an opportunity for you if you want to ask Sarah some questions about the presentation more general questions or about the practical uh, training session later on. But first of all, we have another poll. So where within the built environment do you feel that carbon accounting can have the biggest impact? Extraction of raw materials, logistics, installing building materials on site, or end of life emissions associated with those materials? Okay, and just looking at the poll, I just realised there probably should have been an answer for all of the above, because as you can see, it's quite an even split, um, with logistics coming up at 30 and end-of-life emissions coming up at 30%, but it is quite even, so you, the, the argument is it could post, it is all of the above. So now, uh, finally, we're going to hear from Anne-Marie. Anne-Marie is an impact manager at BEST. She has a degree in renew, renewable and environmental technologies from the University of Glasgow. She works uh, as an impact manager for BEST, but also with Energy Technology Partnership, where she's got a role as a business development manager, promoting collaboration between industry and academia within the low carbon energy sector. Anne-Marie has developed a process for BEST, which will help to calculate potential embodied and operational carbon savings for projects that we support. Welcome, Anne-Marie. Hi. Uh, can you see my presentation okay? Yep, we can see that fine, thank you. Thank you. Uh, right, uh, morning everyone, um, and thank you for the introduction, Kay. Um, so I'm going to give a quick presentation of the work that we've been doing at BEST around carbon accounting over the uh, past uh, few months. Um, so why, why should we calculate carbon emissions um, savings? So um, both of the presentations are kind of covered quite a few of these points already, but also we all know that the Scottish Government has set ambitious targets to reach net zero by 2045. Uh, so BEST has aligned their mission to support um, uh, 
target to sorry, best has aligned their mission to support this and the built environment to reach um, zero carbon. Uh, sustainability and reducing carbon footprint should be embedded through all our activities. Um, economic impact should not be the only focus when we look at innovative projects. Um, reducing embodied and operational carbon is equally, if not even more important. Uh, but actually, often these would have been achieved through efficiency, efficiencies anyway, uh, but they have simply not been measured or captured accordingly. So by calculating carbon savings, we can measure the impact that our activities can potentially achieve. We can establish a baseline for how things are done now, calculate carbon footprint for new proposed products or processes, and compare these two to calculate savings. Um, and if specific uh, KPIs have been set, these calculations will help to measure against um, set targets. Um, so at best, we're aiming to, or the plan is to report on the carbon savings that are achieved by projects that we support. Um, we have always done this, but we've not really had a process in place to help uh, the companies that we work with, work with to, to, you know, to how they can actually achieve these. Uh, so we have created a process uh, that will hopefully help to capture this data. Um, and it has been specifically developed to help with the application process or the application for support process. Uh, we have a methodology which has been prepared in collaboration with MAPIT and um, Associates. And also to accompany this, we have also uh, an Excel-based carbon calculation tool. And both of these two um, tools are um, already available on our website. And you can see the link there. Um, right, so the premises of the, for our methodology, and this is actually quite a, a common one, um, probably familiar already, some of you could see with this uh, life cycle analysis. Um, so initially, you need to establish the scope of your projects. And this is something that Sarah already mentioned as well. Um, so you can either do a high level assessment and concentrate on the stages where you believe that the biggest impacts are achieved. Alternatively, a full life cycle assessment can be prepared, looking uh, for example, a product full life cycle from cradle to grave. So this step, if you're looking at this graph, um, will also help you to establish if you're going to calculate embodied or operational carbon. Uh, so you can see that probably for if you're looking at construction industry, um, a lot of it is to do with the start of the, um, the stages, like the, the first two stages, because obviously you've got your raw materials uh, and, and also your construction installation process. Just as equally, uh, this is something that Leah already mentioned as well. It's about the built environment and how your house has been uh, built for their, um, you know, for their energy. Uh, so when it comes to solar panels or heat pumps, um, et cetera. So we have, uh, uh, so as I previously mentioned, uh, the principle of the process is to compare the as is process um, to uh, the proposed new processes. So by using conversion factors from reliable sources, the carbon factors can be calculated for both operational and embodied carbon. So here's the, you can see two examples. So for operational carbon, uh, we have activity data for electricity use. Um, there are um, conversion uh, factors that are available. Uh, these are what ones are taken from the uh, UK government uh, website. So the way that you calculate is to take your activity data times by the conversion factor, which gives you the uh, kilogram of uh, uh, CO2 equivalent. Uh, and similar to the, um, the operational, but then we're talking about your embodied carbon, so your materials. So we have your uh, 150 kilogram of insulation, and then you have conversion factors for this as well. So again, just times by the amount of the material uh, with the uh, conversion factors, and that gives you the kilogram of CO2 equivalent. So we have um, created a simple Excel-based tool uh, to help with these calculations. Uh, so there's third-party databases that are used in order to attain the conversion factors. 
Uh, so this tool simply allows you to gather the data and do the comparison between the current as is pro product process, product or a process, uh, and the new proposed processes. So for embodied carbon, uh, uh, you would retrieve the conversion factors for all the materials that are utilised. Um, but what I would say is just very quickly, depending on the source, you just need to be very careful if the conversion factors are given as a kilogram of CO2 equivalent per kilogram of material or per ton of material. So you can see in this example that I have, um, this, this is from, from the spreadsheet. So you basically just put in your current process or how it would be traditionally done. So there's an example there for, for example, a traditional clay brick. I haven't put in a new process, but you could have, you could be comparing that, for example, to a eco brick. And then it just gives you the, the, uh, the difference between those two. Uh, and then you would just need to see if you would be scaling this up um, just based on, like, for example, how, how much material would be um, manufactured per year or per five years and so forth. So that's just very quick uh, introduction to what we are doing at the best. Um, so thank you very much for listening. Um, and uh, I will pass back on to you, Kate. Thank you, Anne-Marie. And again, you'll have an opportunity to, if you want to ask Anne-Marie any questions uh, about the presentation, you can do that. But just before that, we've got our final poll of the day. So if you want to participate in the final one. So what area of net zero building would be of most value to you or your business? Is it fabric first training, sustainable insulation training, mass timber training, carbon accounting standards or passive house standards? And it's good to see that the people who are on the webinar today are all on because they're interested in carbon accounting standards, but also interested in sustainable um, insulation, passive house and fabric frost as well, which and, and mass timber, which makes sense because they're all interconnected when we're looking at net zero buildings and taking a fabric first approach. So now um, we've got some questions that have come in already. So I'll just um, ask the panel. We've got a question that's come in from Sarah, and the question is. Would any of the speakers have recommendations for carbon accounting tools for not novices or small practices? So, anyone? Um, yeah, Sarah. Oh, you're on mute. Yeah. Still muted, Sarah. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> Hi, I was saying that I think probably the one that Anne Marie's just presented would be a good starting point. Um, I mean, there are various protocols as as I've talked about. Uh, yeah, and I mean, looking at Briam, if you're involved with Briam at all, you use that in projects. There are resources within Briam to be able to do it. You have um, one click LCA as well, which is quite a good tool, which plugs into different, um, you know technology that you may already be using as well. So there are tools out there, I think, you know, even within some of the sort of BIM tools, there are materials takeoffs and plugins that you can get to to measure materials quantities. From an operational energy point of view, um yeah, again there are various technologies available. You can use things that are looking just focusing on the operational energy, so the building in use. From a design and construction perspective, again, you're back to your BIM with your sort of energy modelling or your um, building regulations compliant tools, um, that kind of thing. So all in all, yeah, I think BIM is probably a good starting point. But if you're not using BIM on projects, then maybe just using spreadsheets and, and the likes of the best tool that Anne-Marie's um, shown there would be a good starting point as well. Okay, you're on mute. Uh, another question that's come in from David. And David's asking, given the complexities of carbon accounting and the need to look both up and down the supply chain, do we need a supply chain or sector-wide approach? 
And if so, who should lead? So, anyone wish to answer? Yeah. Well, I think, as I say, UKGBC at the moment is a very good signpost because they've done a lot of work and they've produced a lot of guidance and resources specifically aimed at construction and real estate to sort of distill down all the stuff that's out there into manageable, you know, performers and templates and things like that as well. So, but yeah, I think that, that they do take a sector wide view of it. And just to say, uh, Sarah, the module that you're producing, you'll have like all these links to different documentation, yes. and, and and so the, the the module will really be a good you know place to start, along with Anne Marie's tool uh, for people who want to just you know start that process. Yeah, within the workshops, we will give some real world examples of how it's been implemented, why it's been implemented, what the benefits are, different templates like that that you can use. Yeah, there are examples in there. Yeah, it's just a quick one from me as well. So we, um, another project that BEST have been involved in was uh, um, funded by Scottish Enterprise. Um, and uh, we had um, all the innovation centres were involved um, and also uh, we had 40 different SMEs and it was a pilot project um, and uh, we were supported by a third party company. Um, so we used their um, web tool. It's called the uh, Impact Forecast. Um, that's the name of the company. And um, so I'm kind of hoping that something will come at the back of that um, with Scottish Enterprise. So again, this is something like Sarah is saying as well. It's, it's, it's very difficult to, you know, and, and all these tools, there are tools out there, but it's to find the one that it fits your fits your company, and that's the key. So, and this is one of the reasons why I, or we created this tool for BEST is because you're trying to look at it, what what, do, what would we use it for? Um, and it's very difficult to then sometimes you're looking at other tools that are, you know, so there are some free tools out, out there as well, but it's just to find that right one. Um, so but I'm really hoping that something will come uh, from this Scottish Enterprise uh, pilot project, because that's exactly the question. It's like we should really have something that's kind of sector wide that um, supports um, the the whole supply chain. Um, so fingers crossed. Thanks, Anne-Marie. Another question has come in from Paul. Uh, similar, he's asking: Is it easy to use carbon accounting on existing buildings? Um, I can answer that one. I uh, my startup currently works with that. We have been working with that for the past two years, and it's quite difficult. It's an area of research. Uh, there is some papers, some LCAs that have done um, estimates about the uh, the the tons of materials per square meter of buildings, depending on the use of the building. Based on this, we can know more or less how much material you can find in each type of building, in each type of locations, also depending on the geographic location, because depending on the weather, obviously the, the materials that you're going to use are quite different. So it's a little bit complex, however, it's not impossible. And is always, uh, if you're interested in that, one of the tips that I can give you is to contact a local a demolition company and normally these numbers they already have it so they have an average of the materials that they can extract from a specific buildings and based on that you can extrapolate how much material is going to come out of a building that, that you're picturing and also for sorry just another comment just to add on what leah was saying about the materials so obviously for operational carbon it's always easier to do because you know what the energy use is so you can just look at the, the bill you can see what the kilowatt hours um, and that's simply by using the conversion factors that are available freely on the, the UK government website you can do the calculations what the, the carbon footprint is for, for that specific building. So before we stop for the day just any other comments from any of the speakers? fine okay so please don't forget to register for the carbon accounting practical training which will take place on wednesday the first of june at the innovation center and Anne marie and um, dr sarah graham will both be there and dr sarah graham will be you know doing the content of the module there and as she mentioned doing some real life examples 
for people to participate in. So it's an excellent way for people to get some hands-on training in this area. So if you're interested in this, I would suggest that you, you log on and you, 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 know, you secure your place straight after the webinar today because spaces are limited and you can sign up after this session. So please ensure you register your interest in the link and Daniel, Daniel will post it in the chat and just select which area you're interested in. We'll contact you then directly with what options of courses are available, but I, I would assume that most of you on this call today are interested in the carbon accounting, but you, again, you could be in, also interested in the sustainable uh, materials as well. Thank you very much to Leah, Sarah and Anne-Marie for supporting the carbon accounting webinar today and the wider fabric and structure project. We hope this project will have the desired impact, which is to work, is, which is to work towards a net zero carbon built environment. Thank you to Danielle, eh, who always working hard behind the scenes, and to the full team eh, for low carbon learning and all the hard work they put into this project. Thank you. Thank you for having me today. Thank you. Bye now.